the Gila monster, Gila Derma Suspecta. These guys are an icon of the American Southwest. They're known for their beauty, for their amazing studded skin, and for their venom. They also are known for their mystery. Today, I want to share with you their captive care and what makes them awesome pet reptiles. Hi, I'm TC Houston, former professional zookeeper, lifelong reptile fanatic, and blue tongue skink breeder. And this is Reptile Mountain TV, evidence-based, captive bred, and animal-focused. This is a banded Gila monster, Heloderma suspectum synctum, also known as a Utah banded Gila monster because this one hails from the locality of Washington County, Utah. Um, this one's actually captive bred several generations but we can trace your lineage all the way back, always huffy. And guys, we're gonna to talk today about their captive care, one of the best and easiest to keep captives. And aside from the fact that they're venomous, one of the best lizard pets around. One of the most important parts about obtaining a captive bred Gila monster is a getting, getting them from a quality breeder in a legal fashion. That's absolutely paramount. Uh, there are several really good breeders out there. The top three that come to my mind are Doc Mark Seward, Dr. Mark Seward, who literally wrote the book on Heloderma cap propagation. You can find him at docseward.com. Then you can also find uh, Steve Angeli. Uh, he is out of California, and his website is Heloderma Horridum, I believe, or Horridum, yeah, it's Heladermahoridum.com. He goes by Horridum Angeli, or Angeli. He is an excellent dude. I've, I've had purchased animals from him, and he's outstanding. Now, the last gentleman that I'd say is actually a couple. It's uh, Steve and Karen Osborne out of Whitefish, Montana. And this is where I've obtained uh, this little guy, Alphaba. They breed both Utah banded, locality, traceable uh, Gila's, as well as Arizona banded Gila's. They are also outstanding, and you can find them at professionalbreeders or probreeders.com. So, one important thing is to get it from a legal place. Now, because these animals are protected in every state that they exist, you need to have a paper trail and that says that one, that they were captive bred and that you purchased the animal and the transfer of ownership occurred from, from the previous owner to you, whether that's a breeder or a previous owner to you. That is absolutely important to ensure that you are in compliance with the Lacey Act, because if you don't, any illegal activity could be in violation of the Lacey Act, especially if the animal crossed state lines or if the animal's not native. Now, if it's native, I'm pretty sure that most states where Gila's exist uh, ban captive ownership, but I could be wrong. I know Arizona does, aside from certain permits. Um, California, I think there's certain permits, but I'm not certain. So I encourage you to go to either municode.com, which is M-U-N-I-C-O-D-E, then look up your state and find your city and local laws about keeping venomous. And then you can also go to your local state's um, wildlife department website and start asking around about the legalities of venomous reptiles because it is important to be legal. It is important to follow the law because the law is there for a purpose. So when handling a Gila Dermid, either a beaded lizard or a Gila monster, you are putting yourself at risk because these are venomous lizards and no, although their venom has never caused a recorded fatality in um, raw modern science, they certainly could. I've spoken with a couple people who've been bitten and venomated one was put into cardiac arrest, a heart attack, and had they not had medical intervention and gone to the hospital and been revived, they would have died. So it is not some sort of uh, little tiny bite nip thing that you just don't worry about. It is definitely a medical emergency. And therefore, it needs to be uh, considered a very risky behavior or activity to handle these animals. Now, it can be handled safely. 
safely means restricting their head movement. Now, I am not pinching hard on him. However, I have my hand, my thumb behind his shoulder with my thumb right here. If he wants to whip around, he cannot physically get me. Also, my finger is right here and he cannot physically whip around and get me. But I'm not harming him in any way and he is still loose. See, he's trying and he can't get to me. And that is a safe manner and I'm also supporting the lower part of his body. I'm not holding him by the tail. That's not safe, nor for him and his welfare, nor for me. And when I have the uh, hand, this hand thumb thing with he can't really back out of this because my thumbs are behind his, kind of in his armpits, but not bad. And that actually sustains him quite well. Some people like to do it like this. Let me move carefully. Where they put two fingers on each side. See that? He's trying to come around, but he can't get to me. Um, he's trying, but he can't. And uh, I don't like that nearly as much as the, just the finger right here. Um, it's just more comfortable for me. One thing that some folks do is they try to free handle. They go, oh, it's puppy dog tame. I've had it since a baby. I've had him since a baby. But I want you to watch something real quick. Just watch. Oh. Did it work? Let's try it with my hat. See, it kind of bothers him. Well, he didn't do it that time. But the other time on the other take, he snapped his head back and tried to snap at the hand that was way too high. See that? But... How would you, well, why would you do that, right? Well, you wouldn't. But if you were free handling this animal, and what if a moth, what if a moth goes across the light and overshadows the light for a second, and that lizard freaks out and snaps at the nearest thing that's around him, and it's you. You can't control everything in your environment. And so that's why free handling is dangerous, irresponsible, and mm, reckless. It's just not a professional activity. That's why hands-on, only when necessary too, really, because these animals aren't really a, a cuddly animal. They don't enjoy being held. They're not interested in that kind of mental stimulation. They, there's definitely no data to say, oh yay, this is a happy lizard because he's being held. There's no data to that. In fact, their brains don't even have the capacity to have that level of emotion. So truly, handling them is literally just for needs-based only. And I recommend that you always use it safely with the hands right here. See how he's trying to come around? But he can't get me because I just have my hand here. And it's blocking. Physiologically, it's not gonna happen. But if I were to just let him free roam through my fingers, anything could happen. And that would be reckless and dangerous. See, I was trying now and he still can't get me. So, this is again, not a how-to, just for informational purposes. So when it comes to housing Gila Dermids, or Gila monsters especially, Gila Dermida suspectum, they are not highly active animals. In fact, they don't need a lot of aerobic exercise. The only times they move about are to find mates or to find food or water. If food and water are relatively uh, available, they just need enough space to move around and keep their body toned. They don't have the cognitive appraisal and the part of their brain that associates with value. So space is like room in their enclosure is, is, is meaningless to them. It's not like you give them more space, they're gonna be somehow more pleasured or more active. Nope, they're gonna sleep 90% of their life anyway, because that's what they do in the wild. Rep, uh, Gila monsters spend approximately 80 or more percent of their life asleep in humid burrows below the ground in the darkness. And that is because they are not actually designed to be out in the hot, dry environment where they live. They actually do quite well in cool and humid environment. The most active temperature for a Gila monster is about 80 something degrees, 86 degrees or so. They're not a high temperature animal. In fact, you keep them too hot, they're going to get ill and probably perish. Also, you keep them too dry, they're gonna have significant shedding issues and they're gonna have significant respiratory issues. They actually use the humidity in the burrows to help with their respiration as well. So as far as cage size goes, a 40 gallon breeder, around three to four and a half square feet of space is more than adequate in, for a Gila monster to thrive. I know humans, we assign value to space. We look and we go, oh, they're cramped. But the reality is that their brains don't have that capacity. 
So as long as they can effectively thermoregulate and move freely, that is an appropriate amount of space. Anything larger is only for our benefit, not necessarily for theirs. There's no data to say that they're benefiting from that larger space whatsoever. No matter what science, there is no science to it. There, there is no science data to it. There is science to it, and the science is in their brain that they don't have the parts of the brain that have been correlated and cause, found causation to create cognitive appraisal, high-level emotions, and value, give value to that space. The only thing they value is being able to do what they need to do, their natural behavior, which is 90% of the time is sleep, and the other part of the time is forage for food and water, which they can do in a 40-gallon breeder just fine. When it comes to enclosures, security is absolutely essential. These are venomous lizards, so they do pose a risk and a threat to anyone who would try to interact with them. Therefore, they should be the enclosures should be absolutely spot on secure. The screen behind you has been tested to 120 pounds. The um, actual lid has been secured with wood underneath each panel and compressed with screws that you can actually pick up the entire enclosure from the top of the lid and it will not come off. The lid's been secured with clips here and also secured with a keyed lock entry. Because Gila monsters don't have a uh, fang delivery system, uh, they don't need a double mesh screen to ensure that a strike wouldn't actually penetrate if someone were to put their hand on the screen. So that's also not a worry with Gila's. However, you do need to have a secure lid. Along with the security of the lid, what really needs to happen is you need to label it. It needs to be labeled with what's inside and the risks involved with what's inside. I label it with both English and Spanish. I say what's inside, the Gila monster, then I say venomous lizard or um, lagarto venenoso, I think is how I say it. My Spanish isn't that great. And then I also label it with do not handle both in English and in Spanish so that not only do you know what it is, but what not to do. I'm giving clear instructions to ensure and reduce minimum liability with anything that's venomous. In addition, I also put on there the regulations for the location where I'm at so that anyone who comes in knows immediately what laws are being followed and allow for this animal to be here. Because although many law enforcement whom I have friends with and I very much respect, although they have most of the time really good intentions, sometimes when they don't know all the laws, they are taught to default to common sense. And sometimes people's common sense say, oh, venomous, you can't have it, or you shouldn't have it in their own common sense. And they would come in and if the labels weren't there to say, hey, actually I can have this legally and here's why, um, they might confiscate it, say I'm in a car accident, say something happens, they're in the house for some other reason and they, they go, oh, we need to take that out too. No, you don't and no, you can't because of the laws. And I put that on there just to cover my bases because I really don't want my animal's life disrupted by someone's good intentions that are poorly applied. So as far as thermal regulation goes, these guys do well at 75 degrees on the cool end Fahrenheit and no more than 92 degrees on the warm end Fahrenheit. Again, like I have, uh, like I say, these guys actually do quite well in, yes, they live in the hot, dry Southwest desert, but one thing's very interesting is they spend 80 plus percent of their time underground in cool, humid, dark burrows. So they are actually, very much accustomed to cooler temperatures and their peak activity levels from research by Dr. Daniel Beck was that they are about 86 per, or eight, at 86 degrees that's where they're at their pinnacle movement and so that's not all that hot that would not make sense to me if I'm thinking dry hot deserts in Arizona or Las Vegas and or south into that area I would think ooh, hot dry mmm but in reality they're actually underground during most of that heat with cool, humid hides. That's why I've actually applied this animal, given this animal cypress mulch as a, as a bedding, where I spray that down every once in a while to allow him to enjoy some humidity. I have also put him, uh, I will also soak him once once in a while in, in uh, nice, about inch deep water, allow him to drink. So, 
As far as thermoregulation, they need a warm spot. I'd shoot for a basking temperature of 90. Uh, and then I also shoot for a cool end at about 72 to 75. That is perfect for a Gila. Too hot and they're gonna perish. So make sure that you're checking your temperatures. As I alluded to with the temperature and the fact that they're in humid hides or humid, <laughs> humid burrows in the wild, hey, let's talk about hydration with these guys. They can do fine with just a water bowl that is not large enough for them to go into. They don't necessarily need to soak in their water bowl. In the wild, they're conditioned to um, absorb as much water as possible because it's so rare and uncommon. So if they were to find water in the wild where they were able to soak in it, they would by nature. Now, if you give them a bowl big enough, a water dish big enough that they can soak their whole body in it, they will, and likely they will for hours and hours, and actually to their detriment, where they will sit in there instead of thermoregulate. I've had some animals in the past that would actually eat and then go soak in their water, and they actually would have digestion issues and end up regurgitating because they didn't actually go bask when they should have because they were so intent on sitting in the water instead. So I personally don't leave them with enough room to get in their water bowl. Instead, I soak them uh, on occasion and then I provide them with cypress mulch. But they don't need a super high humidity, that's not necessary, but just enough to allow them to have proper sheds. Most people have no problem in just normal American households. When it gets really dry in the winter, I will spray down the mulch a little bit to get it moist so that they can have that, but they still also have heat, so that's important. So hydration, just a standard water bowl works just fine. Along with hydration comes the humid hide option. And some people uh, I know and other zoos have given humid hides to them as well. So they keep them on a dry substrate. They keep them with a small water bowl, but they also provide them with a humid hide where they can go in and get humidity. I would recommend if you do a humid hide that you have the entrance on the top because these little puppies love to dig. They got them big old digging hands and they will dig. So if they go into a humid hide, they will dig all of the sphagnum moss and all that moisture stuff out of the hide where it will dry out and be a whole mess as opposed to keeping it in the hide. But if you put it from the top, yeah, they can dig around, get their digging behavior done, but they aren't gonna pull it all out typically. So that's one recommendation I have if you are gonna use a humid hide. I have used humid hides in the past with other Gila's and other setups, but not at this setup. Feeding wise, these guys are awesome. They are super easy because babies almost always will take pinky mice or even pinky rats, depending on how big the baby, the hatchling is, they will take them right off the bat. And I recommend frozen thawed or pre-killed and absolutely never live. Not for some ethical reason, but for the fact that it is practical. These animals are not apex predators. They are awesome. They have an amazing, but their venom is not designed to kill and their venom and their bite is not really designed to kill either. And so they have a heck of a time. And if they bite that mouse wrong or that rodent, that rodent can come around and inflict some significant injuries to your animal. So I recommend highly that you use either pre-killed rodents or frozen thawed rodents. Um, now, these guys will take a meal that's no wider than the side of their jaws. I think that's the rule that I've been going by. So babies usually are taking pinky rats and that works perfectly. And then as they grow, I either add a second pinky rat and then move to fuzzy rats. Right now, Elphaba is an adult three-year-old and he eats two um, adult mice. Now I do cut the tails off because they seem to stick out and he has that issue with that. But other than that, it is the easiest thing because they get all of their nutrition from the whole prey item of the rodent. Occasionally you can feed them quail. You can also feed them pasteurized egg whites. For a finicky baby or a finicky feeder, you dip that tip of that mouse in some pasteurized egg whites and usually, bam, they will take that right down. You can also give egg whites as a treat or a snack and they will gobble them down. As far as lighting goes, Gila monsters spend 80% of their lives underground and probably another 15% of their lives foraging in the cool evenings after dark. So they are not a midday sun basker. This is not your desert iguana. 
that is for certain. And so their skin may is not necessarily as adapted to absorb and synthesize vitamin D3 nearly as much um, as maybe a bearded dragon who's a noontime basker. These guys are not necessarily noontime baskers. They will come out in the early morning and late evening and soak up some sunlight. So there's no definite uh, detriment to providing UVB or specialized lighting. However, there is no evidence anywhere to show that these guys benefit from UV lighting whatsoever. So you can do it, but they're gonna live into their 30s without it just fine and thrive. So I just use regular old LED lights for him. He does get some ambient light from the daylight from this room. And then I also use a halogen, um, Zilla Mini halogen 25 watt bulb. And that heats his basking area where he's sitting right now to a perfect 90 degrees. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you guys. If you like this video or you like other Reptile Mountain videos, go ahead and hit the like button, hit the share button or write a comment, let me know what you think. Also, check out these superheroes right here. These folks are my patrons. These are the individuals that are supporting Reptile Mountain TV, the cause of getting out evidence-based, quality reptile information to you through YouTube and Patreon. So these guys, thank you. Thank you to my patrons, and you're welcome to jump on over to Patreon and check it out. Let me know what you think. Of course, you're welcome to you know, join. There are some cool rewards here and there. Everything from magnets and knowing that you're supporting Reptile Mountain up to first opportunity to purchase uh, Blue Tongue Skinks for me when they're available, as well as uh, free t-shirts and of course, patron-only content that's coming starting in January of 2018. So thank you so much. And guys, remember, opinion is not fact.